Grace and peace be with you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And welcome to this online worship service of Highland Presbyterian Church on this, the fifth Sunday in the season of Lent. How grateful we are that we who are scattered are drawn close and together in one spirit to share in this time of worship together. On our website, highlandpres.org, where you may have found this worship service, there are resources to share in this time of worship, including a companion bulletin, links to our online giving portal, and a link to sign our friendship pad to note that you have shared with us. Responding to God's abundant and wondrous love, there are many ways to engage and share in ministry with us both here at Highland and beyond. And we invite you to seek out opportunities through our website and this week's new highlights newsletter, where you will also find information about our upcoming plans for Holy Week. As we look towards the celebration of Easter, we also look towards the receiving of our one great hour of sharing offering for the Presbyterian denomination. We now share with you a glimpse of what this offering is all about. We are grateful for your generous sharing in this offering. And there are many ways to give, including through our online portal where there is a drop-down box to specify this offering, as well as dropping a check off at the church office drop box, noting the one great hour of sharing in the memo. With gratitude for all of the ways that we share and respond to God's wondrous love, let us now prepare our hearts and minds for this time of worship.
Friends, we know that each day is a gift from God. Each moment is a chance to learn more of who God is and who we are. Each choice that we make is one which can help us live more into who God is calling us to be. May we use this time of worship to learn more about God's hopes for us, to hear more of who God yearns for us to be, and to commit more to working with God, to love ourselves, to love our enemies, to love this world. May we use this time to draw closer to God. Let us pray. Oh God, you help us to learn more about who you are and about who you have created us to be. You are goodness. You are mercy. You are gentleness and kindness. You are righteousness and faithfulness. You are the light of our salvation and the sustainer of our souls. Each and every second of each and every day, you look at us and fill us with your wondrous love. Through this time of worship, renew us and reshape us that we might live reflecting your steadfast love. That we might live reflecting who we truly are, your beloved. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. It is through the act of confession that we realize our desire for God 
in our hope for God's mercy. It is in admitting the truth of our lives that we take the first step towards God's healing and wholeness. So let us bring our confessions before God, praying first in unison, followed by a time of silent personal confession. Let us pray. God of glory, have mercy upon us. We love to hate our enemies and fail to love our neighbors. We love to quote commandments and fail to love you, our God. Forgive us, O God, and give us your grace. Teach us the way of your word and transform our living so that we might live for your glory and show the wonder of your love in Jesus Christ, our Lord. We make our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Hear the good news. There is forgiveness in steadfast love with God who saves us from all our sins. God has shown this love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, believe in this good news of the gospel. For in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning, Highland friends, and welcome to this time for young disciples. I'd like to invite the children to come a little closer to their screens for our time together. This morning, our scripture tells us that Jesus was gathered with a bunch of people, and he was teaching them. It was called the Sermon on the Mount and he taught lots of really important things. One really important and very hard thing that he taught was that we should love our enemies. That's really hard to do. But today I wanna to share a story of a little six-year-old girl who was able to do just what Jesus asked. The Story of Ruby Bridges by Robert Coles, illustrated by George Ford published by Scholastic, Inc. Ruby Bridges was born in a small cabin near Tylertown, Mississippi. We were very poor, very, very poor, Ruby said. My daddy worked picking crops. We just barely got by. There were times when we didn't have much to eat. The people who owned the land were bringing in machines to pick the crops, so my daddy lost his job and that's when we had to move. I remember us leaving. I was four, I think. In 1957, the family moved to New Orleans. Ruby's father became a janitor. Her mother took care of the children during the day. After they were tucked in bed, Ruby's mother went to work scrubbing floors at a bank. Every Sunday, the family went to church. We wanted our children to be near God's spirit, Ruby, Ruby's mother said, we wanted them to start feeling close to God from the very start. At that time, black children and white children went to separate schools in New Orleans. The black children were not able to receive the same education as the white children. It wasn't fair, and it was against the law. In 1960, a judge ordered four black girls to go to two white elementary schools. Three of the girls were sent to Madonna 19. Six-year-old Ruby Bridges was sent to the first grade in William France Elementary School. Ruby's parents were proud that their daughter had been chosen to take part in an important event in American history. They went to church. They sat there and prayed to God, Ruby's mother said, that we'd all be strong and we'd all have courage and we'd get through any trouble and Ruby would be a good girl and she'd hold up her head high and be a credit to her own people and a credit to all the American people. We prayed long and we prayed hard. On Ruby's first day, a large crowd of angry white people gathered just outside Fran's elementary school. 
The people carried signs that said they didn't want black children in a white school. People called Ruby names. Some wanted to hurt her. The city and state police did not help. The president of the United States ordered federal marshals to walk with Ruby into the school building. The marshals carried guns. Every day for weeks that turned into months, Ruby experienced that kind of school day. She walked to the Franz school surrounded by marshals, wearing a clean dress and a bow in her hair and carrying her lunch pail. Ruby walked slowly for the first few blocks. As Ruby approached the school, she saw a crowd of people marching up and down the street. Men and women and children shouted at her. They pushed towards her. The marshals kept them from Ruby by threatening to arrest them. Ruby would hurry through the crowds and not say a word. The white people in the neighborhood would not send their children to school. When, Ray, when Ruby got inside the building, she was all alone except for her teacher, Miss Henry. There were no other children to keep Ruby company, to play with and to learn with, to eat lunch with. But every day, Ruby went into the classroom with a big smile on her face, ready to get down to the business of learning. She was polite and she worked well at her desk, Miss Henry said. She enjoyed her time there. She didn't seem nervous or anxious or irritable or scared. She seemed as normal and relaxed as any child I've ever taught. So Ruby began learning how to read and write in an empty classroom, an empty building. Sometimes I would look at her and wonder how she did it, said Miss Henry. How she went by those mobs and sat there all by herself and yet seemed so relaxed and comfortable. Miss Henry would question Ruby in order to find out if the girl was really nervous and afraid, even though she seemed so calm and confident. But Ruby kept saying she was doing fine. The teacher decided to wait and see if Ruby would keep on being so relaxed and hopeful, or if she'd gradually begin to wear down, or even decide that she no longer wanted to go to school. Then one morning, something happened. Miss Henry stood by the window in her classroom, like she usually did, watching Ruby walk toward the school. Suddenly, Ruby stopped. Right in front of the mob of howling, screaming people, she stood there facing all of them, men and women. She seemed to be talking to them. Miss Henry saw Ruby's lips moving, and wondered what Ruby could be saying. The crowd seemed ready to kill her. The marshals were frightened. They tried to persuade Ruby to move along. They tried to hurry her into her school, but Ruby wouldn't budge. Then Ruby stopped talking and walked into the school. When she went into the classroom, Miss Henry asked her what happened. Miss Henry told Ruby that she had been watching and that she was surprised when Ruby stopped and talked with the people in the mob. Ruby became irritated. I didn't stop and talk with them, she said. Ruby, I saw you talking, Miss Henry said. I saw your lips moving. I wasn't talking, said Ruby. I was praying. I was praying for them. Every morning, Ruby had stopped a few blocks away from the school to say a prayer for the people who hated her. This morning, she forgot until she was already in the middle of the angry mob. When school was over for the day, Ruby hurried through the mob as usual. After she walked a few blocks and the crowd was behind her, Ruby said the prayer she repeated twice a day before and after school. Please, God, try to forgive those people because even if they say those bad things, they don't know what they're really doing. So you could forgive them just like you did those folks a long time ago when they said terrible things about you.
Let us pray. God, help us to be courageous like Ruby Bridges when it's time for us to forgive our enemies. Amen. Before we turn to our scriptures for this day, let us turn to God in prayer. O oh God, as your word is read and proclaimed this day, nudge open our hearts by the gentle working of your spirit that we may hear your truth. Shape us into new persons who resemble the truth we hear in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first reading for this day comes from Matthew's Gospel, the fifth chapter, verses 38 through 48. Let us indeed listen for God's word to us. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer, but if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, Go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading this day comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, reading in the fifth chapter, verses 6 through 11. Listen now for God's word. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more surely, having been reconciled, will we be saved by His life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Enemy love is the heart of the gospel. Let's think about that for a moment. Enemy love is the heart of the gospel. I mean, really, if we think hard enough about what both Jesus and Paul have said, it's offensive, outrageous even. I mean, I have to confess that my temptation here is to protect y'all from Jesus and protect myself too while I'm at it. I feel the need to step in and say, uh, I'm, no, I'm not really sure that's what he meant. Like Will Willimon did at one Sunday after preaching a sermon on Jesus' call to forgive, when a person emerged from the church and accosted him at the door, saying, Do you mean to tell me that Jesus expects me to forgive my abusive husband who made my life hell for ten years until I finally had the guts to leave him? 
Williman says he immediately moved into his defensive mode with, well, I mean, we only have 20 minutes for a sermon and I can't appropriately qualify everything here. And I do believe that spouse abuse is a terrible evil, but um, I mean, this is the sort of thing you would expect Jesus to say. I mean, he, he did say that we ought to forgive 70 times 7. And that's a great deal of forgiveness. And he did say to forgive our enemies, and I cannot think of a worse enemy for you than your ex-husband. And the woman drew herself up to her full, full height. She took a deep breath and she said, good, just checking. With both Jesus and Paul, enemy love is, is right at the heart of things. I mean, anyone can love somebody who loves them back, Jesus says. The harder thing to which he calls his, his followers is to love the ones who do not love us, the ones who may hate us or who stand against everything we hold dear. Paul sets all of this up by, by noting that it was when we were at our worst that God reconciled us through Christ's saving death and resurrection. God did not wait for us to get our act together God did not withhold action on our behalf until we said how truly sorry we were or when we finally got our minds right about things. While we were enemies, Paul says, that's when God did all of this for us. That may be startling to hear, to think that God perceived us as enemies. But as Paul unfolds his understanding of the gospel in this letter to the Romans, that is what he says. Humanity is an utter mess, and our hope is not in our ability to shape up. Our hope is in God's mercy. But that is exactly what God gives us. Love and mercy that turns us from enemies to friends. Think of the love that's big enough to do that to receive the worst from someone, and to respond with love and forgiveness. That is what God has done for us, says Paul. That is what we are to do for others, says Jesus. John Lewis shares just such an enemy love story in his book, Across That Bridge. We discussed his work in our Listening to Black Voices book group this week. And we found ourselves reflecting on a story that Lewis tells from the, the early days of the Freedom Rider movement in 1961, when Lewis was on a bus that stopped in Rock Hill, South Carolina, en route to Alabama. As soon as he and the white passenger he was sitting on the bus with stepped off the bus, they were assaulted and beaten by a white mob who was opposed to everything that these freedom riders were doing. Battered and bloodied, Lewis was asked by a police officer if he wanted to press charges against Elwin Wilson, one of the men who had beaten him. No, Lewis said. We are not here to cause trouble. We're here so that people will love each other. You know who remembered those words that Lewis said some five decades after he said them? The man who beat him. Nearly 50 years later, Elwin Wilson shared what Lewis had said when he came to see Lewis to apologize for what he had done at that bus station. He remembered Lewis at the Greyhound station bleeding from Wilson's blows and saying, we're not here to cause trouble. We're here so that people will love each other. Those, those words haunted the deeply racist Wilson for decades. Now, Lewis could have pressed charges. He and his colleagues could have fought back. But instead, they bore the brunt of the attack with love, even as they kept on pressing forward towards the goals of the civil rights movement. But in so doing, they changed hearts, and they began the work of transforming a nation. Lewis's act of love turned an enemy into a friend. It took time, 
but it happened. While we were enemies, God acted with love on our behalf in Christ. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This may be the hardest thing that we're called to do as followers of Jesus. I mean, to realize that we were the enemies and were loved anyway. And to remember that we are called to love this way too. Thankfully, we have models like John Lewis. We live in a time that seems more fraught than ever with enemies. For sake of our anger and our distrust of one another, we, we are coming apart at the seams. As Bishop Michael Curry notes in the book that we're reading together through this Lenten season, the large-scale problems we face as humans will not be solved by isolation. When we're busy wagging fingers at each other, we cannot move away from the nightmare and closer to the dream. He goes on to say that love makes it possible to disagree on bedrock convictions and yet stay in relationship. There is a valid concern that doing so forces you to compromise on principles, but sometimes you have to run that risk because of a greater danger, chaos and social self-destruction. I think we have to run that risk, says Curry, especially in the church. We have to know that love can survive meaningful disagreements. Curry says that both in the church and in our nation, across our differences, if we can establish that we are working towards some common good, whether we like each other or not, and we can be brothers and sisters even when all we want to do is fight. With small steps, you and I are called to reach out into a world of hurt and anger and distrust and violence with words and with actions of love, with a vulnerability that defies common sense. Maybe we could begin by watching our words and the way that we speak about those who are different or those with whom we disagree in whatever way. Many of our Asian American neighbors are terrified following murders in Atlanta this week. They've been living in fear for a year because there are those who hear in phrases like Wuhan flu or China virus a permission to attack or threaten those of Asian descent. We can be better than that. Or maybe when someone who believes or who votes differently than you do or I do says something that offends us, instead of attacking or assuming the worst, maybe we could ask ourselves, or maybe even ask them how they came to hold that faith or to perceive the issue that way. I mean, we have to find a way to end this destructive cycle that we are in these days. Gandhi was right when he said, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. I mean, this, this act of curiosity, how did you come to understand it that way? I mean, that, that could be a small step, but what we might get is a relationship instead of just more hate. I think our doing so would make Jesus happy. Now, our efforts this way, they're going to fall short. It's going to be easy for us to resort to the retaliation and the defensiveness that makes us feel secure. Reaching out with love, it might make other people angry. For in so doing, we will often call into question the values that they support. A decision to forgive someone who has caused us harm might make others question our, san our own sanity. I, mean, I know, I, mean, I, I know. It's just not the way the world works 
to try to love this way. Indeed, apart from the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ who calls us to this way of life, none of this is even possible. But let's be honest. The way the world works is not working so well these days. But because Christ's grace has been set loose in the world, extraordinary things can happen. Peace can happen. Forgiveness can happen. Reconciliation can happen. Enemy love can happen. And enemies can become friends and allies in the struggle for God's beloved community. Maybe it can happen with you. Maybe something can happen this day. I don't know. But stories of people like John Lewis who have overcome hate with love inspire me. And knowing that such things are possible fills me with hope. And that hope gives me courage to try. How about you? How about you? Amen. Let us join together in prayer. Gracious and loving God, in this moment of worship, we unite our prayers together as one. While we worship you from spaces all across this neighborhood, in city, and even beyond, we gather as one body in your name. We praise you for the gift of love you so graciously give to us. We ask that you would soften our hearts and open our minds, direct our steps, so that we might more closely follow you, especially in these Lenten days. In this season of wandering, we are thankful that we journey together. We give thanks for those in our lives, seen and unseen, near and far, that walk this road with us. Partners, loved ones, friends, and even strangers that pray for us. Even though we might not be face to face, we have confidence in the love and care we share as your people and are called to make real in the lives we encounter. More than anything, when our route seems to lead straight into wilderness, when we've still got a ways to go, we take heart in you, our Savior, who knows the way, who's been there before, who has conquered it, and comes alongside and meets us here. So we bring before you our grieving hearts as we pray again for communities and lives affected by violence. We pray with hope for a more just world that mirrors your kingdom. We pray for courage to act where we are able to stand up for the rights and lives of others and resist oppression. We pray for the many who are sick, who battle illness and begin the journey of uncertainty. We pray for comfort in healing and compassion. We pray for those who are tired and for those at a loss. We ask for wisdom and direction. We pray for those who grieve, praying for compassion and support to fill their hearts again. In all these things, in every whispered prayer, in every need your children offer today, we ask that our words not be empty, our sentiments not be complicit, that your spirit in us not be quenched. Compassionate God, sometimes life is overwhelming and when morale threatens to break us, and when our unbelief becomes too great, bring us back to you. Bring us back to your comfort and grace. May we experience peace that surpasses all understanding and a love that will not let us go. We pray all these things in Christ's name, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. One way that we respond to the good news of God's love for us in Jesus Christ is by serving this congregation. And there are a variety of ways that we can do that. Patrick Simpson is going to share with us about one of those ways. I bring you greetings on behalf of your nominating committee. I'm Patrick Simpson and I serve as chair this year. We believe that God calls women and men in the church to serve as elders and deacons and that service and leadership facilitates our mission of ministering to each other and the world around us. Especially during this difficult year, we have seen the difference the church makes in our lives and in the life of our community. Highlands deacons and elders working with our, our staff and church members enable this important ministry to happen. The nominating committee is once again asking for your recommendations for Highland members to serve as church officers. We'll need eight elders and eight deacons to serve in the class of 2024. As you reflect on those whom you may want to suggest, we encourage you to use the suggestion form for church officers, which is available on Highland's website. We are grateful for Highland as we make our way through this challenging season. We hope to hear from you as we work together with the spirit to discern our leaders for the years to come. Thank you and onward with spirit. We are grateful for the nominating committee's work and for all who prayerfully ponder this call to service. Serving as an officer and serving on committees are ways to respond to the good news that we hear through Jesus Christ. Another way that we respond to this good news is through the sharing of our money. There are many ways that we can do that this very week. There's online giving, which we can find on our website, highlandprez.org. You can mail a check to the church. You can bring your offering, your tithe, your pledge by the church office. We continue to be so very grateful for the generosity of the saints of Highland. Let us pray. Merciful God, you do not call us to you because we are worthy, but because you yearn for us to be more like you. We do not offer you our gifts in order to earn your love, but to celebrate the wondrous love that you have given us. Inspire us with generosity, O oh God this very week. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
Sisters and brothers, may love be in our words and in our deeds, that hate may be overcome with love, that enemies may become friends and partners in the work of establishing God's beloved community in partnership with God and with one another. As we go forth, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us this day and forevermore. Amen.